I'm Fritz Springmeier. This is now the third presentation today. Today, um, at this time, we are going to discuss numerology. What is the importance of numerology? Well, for most of us common people, it, it doesn't play a big role in our life. But for those who are trying to understand the occult elite, it's a very important tool to understand their thinking. Because much of what they do is based on numerology. Now, there are many different facets of numerology. So, one facet would be astrology. And I want to take a moment to have us think about the history of numbers. Early on, uh, some of your greatest mathematicians were Greeks. And they believed that numbers could represent everything that there was out there. But not only that, but that numbers revealed the mind of God. And so from that time forward until just recently in modern times, it, uh, like during the Middle Ages in European history, mathematicians were also magicians. And a lot of people don't realize that because now mathematics has been uh, secularized where we view numbers and number systems as purely a, a secular scientific endeavor, but even up until Queen Elizabeth the first time, mathematicians like Sir John Dee were also high-level magicians. This uh, presentation will also go into occult symbols. Now here on the banner, if you look down here, Underneath the Joker, uh, you will see some numbers and a playing card. And this artwork on the left-hand side of my banner was done by Cisco when she was trying to uh, do therapy for her mind control. What she was, she the mind control uh, gave had suicide programming that if you revealed anything of the programs you were to commit suicide but she was able to do artwork to show what was in her mind even though she couldn't talk so here she's revealing the role that the cards and the numbers play in her programming So, occult, these are occult symbols from witchcraft. The occult world places a, a high value on symbols. A lot of the communication is done through symbols. And you, in fact, will see some of these symbols, uh, just like the lower left, that witchcraft, uh, Chiquetta, uh, uh, that's very common on Christian Bibles, and so uh, we'll we'll see uh, you will see these witchcraft symbols used throughout uh, society. I might interrupt my flow of thought here to say once you catch on to Illuminati symbolism, occult symbolism, witchcraft, Masonic symbolism. You literally see it everywhere. Our whole world is surrounded by this. And it's why it's so difficult for someone who's in the Illuminati to feel like they can get out because it's ubiquitous. On the back of the American dollar bill is the Illuminati logo, which was placed there by Freemasons. And they know it. And so every time they, they even have a one dollar bill in their hand, they're like reminded of this like ever-present power 
that's around. And so I oftentimes, because I, I just feel like I'm just like bathed or, or surrounded by this, I almost sometimes just turn a deaf ear to it. So uh, my wife in 1990 was a 10 year teacher at Portland Public Schools. And in the late 80s in Portland, I know this is what the story I'm going to tell is so incredible that half the time I tell it, people are just like, no, it can't, that can't be true. Well, it is true. It is true. This story is true, even though you're going to be totally amazed. But the first amazing thing was, is that the Portland Public School District outlawed a number of words, including the, number, the name Christmas. Students were forbidden to say the word Christmas. Now you could be expelled from school for this. And one of the sons of one of the women that was trying to escape from the Illuminati, and he was a Christian, uh, he, was going, he was in high school, and he wrote a very comical poem making fun of the censorship of how they were not allowed to even say the word Christmas. So you know if they, if they take something that's even remotely related to Christ, and those, who, those Christians who are hardcore Christians realize that Christi Christmas is really a solstice celebration. It's actually a pagan holiday, and, and of course it's celebrated in a pagan way, but just the name Christmas is too much for the public schools to put up with. So they have, they have banned it. So you know that they're going to replace that kind of symbolism with something else. So my wife came home with the, the play that they put on once they had gotten rid of the Christmas play. Their play was a winter solstice play. It was an occult ritual. And they, they were celebrating on the, in the play, in the occult rituals that they did at school, um, in their school play, they were celebrating the return of Lucifer. And in the play that the children put on for the parents and the audience, some of the kids had acceptable barcodes on their foreheads and some had unacceptable barcodes. And as many of you may know, within all barcodes, in the beginning and in the middle and the end, this is pretty much universal, there's, there's many different types of barcode systems, but all of the barcode systems that I have seen have a 666 in them that's not intrinsic to actually the number that's being used. So 666, uh, many of you probably know that uh, in the Bible book, the last Bible book of Revelations, that's the number of the beast. And when you go to Satanism, you discover that that number is very popular with them. It's very popular in Hollywood too. So, I don't know how familiar you are with the cult symbols, but when we look at these logos, and once you become familiar with the cult symbology, basically across the board, uh, these big companies' logos are a cult, and some of them are blatantly uh, Illuminati. Right there, you see the pyramid with the all-seeing eye, right? Or the pyramid um, shining. And, and you see these um, occult arches and so forth. And then right there in Texaco, remember we described the pentagram in a circle. And on and on. So uh, maybe after we discuss a little bit more on occult symbols, maybe you'll have a little bit more um, ability to see the occult symbology in, in these things. It's very interesting 
that in the 80s, <clears throat> because I love graphics, I went to college and I got a graphic arts degree, and they were teaching us in graphic arts in college to make these kind of symbols, to use pyramids and stuff. So you can't, you can't conclude when you see an occult symbol that the person who made it knew what they were doing. They might have just been uh, following the trend of the world, so to speak. So numerology serves many purposes. It serves magic, astrology. It serves for codes for mind control, uh, for fixing destin destinies and dates, finding out if one is lucky. So uh, I have one book which uh, uh, I don't sell online. It's Ezekiel 6.3, which uh, gives ritual dates. Essentially, to sum it all up, essentially every day of the year there is some kind of occult ritual that can be done with that. But then there's also certain dates that are actually Illuminati ritual dates. And I, I will tell this for you, for those people that are trying to, like if you have a neighbor watching to see if they go to a ritual or a ritual date, not always are rituals held on the exact day that, it, that you would think that it was going to be held. They might be, on some rituals are held on a, a little bit slightly off the date. So here on the left-hand side, we see two lucky numbers of the Chinese, 168 and 888, because even numbers are lucky for the Chinese. And there's, in the middle, you see a way that the occult can pair numbers. So like A, J, and S equals one, B, K, T equals two. If you get into understanding secret societies, we're talking about Freemasons, Odd Fellows, uh, Kabbalistic groups, you will find across the board that the foundation for these occult groups is the Kabbalah. In Gematria, which is Kabbalistic numbering, is very important within Kabbalah. So basically what I've just told you is, it's like the foundation, uh, the secret hidden knowledge for so many of these groups all goes back to Kabbalistic number systems. Freemasonry grew out of operative masons. If you look around the, uh, around Europe at the great cathedrals, you will notice that the architecture inside some of these, like the, the like in Cologne, Germany, the architecture inside these cathedrals is absolutely mind-boggling. And the numbers and the numerology is absolutely mind-boggling. Because remember what I said previously, the, they believed that you could understand the mind of God by understanding the magical significance of numbers. So the, the trade guilds that built these sacred churches put a lot of numerology into these churches. But there was also some other aspects of these churches that at this point I will bring out to you. Almost across the board, the Catholic Church, which was the church in Europe for many years, as most of you know, they picked pagan occult holy sites to place the churches on. Not only are these Catholic churches placed on pagan uh, ritual sites, but the original pagan altars are underneath the Christian altars or down below. They're still intact. And not only that, but in most of these places, 
portals, portals for spirits. Now we're getting all back, right back to the Archon theme. Portals, underground portals are there in, in most of them. So I found it very interesting as a military historian, I was reading the report of this committee at the end of World War II, uh, there was a European committee made, uh, I don't remember the exact name of the committee, but it was formed to go throughout Europe and survey the damage that had been done to churches. And essentially all of these old churches had at one time been Catholic, some of them were uh, Catholic and then later Protestant. But Across the board, they discover in these destroyed churches, they found the pagan altars. So this gives you um, an interesting look that there has been a secret society, so to speak, of pagan Luciferians within the Catholic Church from very early on that continued using these pagan altars for rituals and um, it's also brings up a whole uh, topic for discussion of what are these portals being used for and so the Freemasonry inherited uh, some of this from the operative Here I have shown you the of Aleister Crowley's book 777 and the, the, the significance of the book is that he, like you see right here, he has these page after page of tables of correspondences. So here we see on the left hand side we see uh, the key scale which is a number and then we see Arabic alphabet, Greek alphabet which is also serves. There were three alphabets the Babylonian, the Greek and the Hebrew all had numerical values for their letters um, so there's you know, the numerology is involved with, with uh, the Greek language and the Babylonian and the Hebrew. So you can write something in Hebrew and then you can, you can take the letters and come up with a numerical value for that word. Well, previously I was showing you the same thing for English. I was showing you the conversion in, for doing numerology for for English words. Now there's a very in interesting phenomenon here and I don't know if how many people, surely other people have, been, have found it besides myself, but if you start doing numerology on words, it's very similar to the research that they have done on water where uh, polluted water has a weird form and water that's been blessed and is around good things has a beautiful form. Well, there is a strange, it's the strangest phenomenon, but a lot of very evil people in history, if you break their names down numeral with numerology, you get something like 666 or you get evil numerology to it. And then people that are good, for some reason, and I don't know why this is, it, it's, a, it's a strange phenomenon, um, that you, for good things in nature and, and with, with humanity and so forth, you very often, uh, it seems to be the trend that you get a good number out of it. Um, I don't believe in astro astrology, I'll just make that clear to the audience. I wrote one of my, uh, in 1979, I wrote seven books on Christian doctrines, and uh, 
though it's, it's a, not very well known that I did, but one of the books I wrote was on, astro on astrology because the scriptures, the Word of God, puts limits on what kind of knowledge we're to use. And astrology, whether it works or doesn't work, I mean, that could be debated, but there is a line drawn by, by Yahweh, and he says, you know, I don't want you to use these occult sciences. So that's off limits, you know. And we know from the traditions that the archons or fallen angels, they provided humankind with a lot of this occult knowledge. And even today, the occult world tries to summon demons and tries to summon fallen angels to get wisdom and knowledge. So they continue even today. And people that were in high level Illuminati meetings tell me about uh, uh, the, the fallen angels that, that participate in their meetings. And back in 1991, the, these women that had been in the Illuminati, they told me that there were Nephilim guardians in their rituals. There's so many things that I have learned and heard from my witnesses, and I don't know percentage-wise whether it's 50% or what, but a large share of this I have had to put on a shelf because it's important for me not to give disinformation. And sometimes you hear these things, and even though several witnesses tell you, you don't know what to make of it. You know, you try to wait until you have something 3D, something tangible, to really know what to do with this information. So there's been a lot of information like this. And this information about guardians, Nephilim, being in the rituals, that was long before people started doing the research. Now in my last talk, I, I showed I showed a slide about the Nephilim and how archaeology, um, people, Christians, Tim Alvarino, who's a friend of mine, Steve Quayle, um, who's just an acquaintance, um, and some of their uh, colleagues, They've been doing research into the giants, and there's, they've actually uncovered archaeological evidence of these huge giants and, and these Nephilim. So now, some of the stuff that I had to put on a shelf 25 years ago, now I'm feeling more comfortable coming out with you about. This is actually the first time I've ever done a talk on numerology. These correspondences are important for several reasons. They're important for working magic, and they're also important, they also use them uh, in terms of setting up the mind control codes and some of that. So, this is giving you one example of how numerology can be used. It says up there in the left hand top, it says witches to do protective magic, take a name and convert it to numbers, then the number is taken to magic square and traced into a sigil to do magic. So the name, the name has been taken, and then this is this is one magic square here. There, there's a magic square for moon and different things. And then you take the the numbers and you draw the sigil like this and then this sigil then is used in the ceremony so it's a, a several step process there. and up here in the top is showing you how you can take a name and turn it into numbers so they start with the name Stuart Farr and the S if you look up on the chart the S is a one so the number over here, it's a little blurry, but it starts out with a one. And the next letter is a T, 
and T is under 2. So it starts out 1, 2 for Stuart. And so that's, that gives you an idea of how this would be used in uh, performing a magic ceremony. And the, this, they might take the name Stuart Farr and they may do a protective ceremony with various uh, elements of, you know, the feathers and all the other stuff, the paraphernalia that they use, the candles, and do some kind of ceremony that they think will uh, perform magic. So again, uh, Numerology serves magic and astrology, right there, that, that repeats what I've talked about. So you look at the name Phoenix. Now the Phoenix is a very important bird within uh, the occult. And in fact, when the United States was being formed, because the majority of leaders forming the United States were Freemasons, it was initially proposed to make the phoenix the national bird of the United States. And they decided that was a little bit too blatant, I guess, so they picked a, a eagle instead. But the eagle is still quite occultic. You'll notice that the Roman Empire and the Roman legions carried the eagle. The Nazis used the eagle as their symbol. And so that goes back to Babylon, too. So, Phoenix, the meaning, one of the meanings is shining one. And so if you use the letters F-E-N-E-X from the Greek, and then you do the numerology for Phoenix, you see it comes out for 666. And Lucifer, another name for Lucifer, which it means light bear or shining one. So Lucifer and Phoenix, are synonymous. And here you see a phenomenon within the occult world is there's a lot of substitution. So instead of saying Lucifer, I could say Phoenix. You see what I mean? You mean shining ones. Shining one means Lucifer. And I'll get more into that. So uh, they have all of this layers and layers of subtle meaning and they get all of these inside jokes and all of this is it, we're surrounded with this stuff. And, and, and so uh, on the right hand side, this is an astrology chart to predict the future and all your numbers. And your, if you do the different uh, rows, they add to 666. Interestingly, if you are to look at astrology, it's very clear from our astrology uh, that um, Yeshua, that was the name, actual name, his, his actual name is no longer was Yahashua, Yeshua for short. And you'll see that the chart here, uh, the astrology chart here, says up there at the top that this is done for uh, Yeshua. His his date of birth, according to astrology, was 9-11. When you see these kind of things, it's like some shivers maybe up your back to realize that in mockery of Christ's birthday, because these people know astrology, believe me, in working with people that were in the Illuminati, astrology is big for them, very big. So these people know, specific, they, there's no no doubt in my mind, they knew exactly what 9-11 was. Astrologically, that's when the stars aligned, that the star that was there in Bethlehem was not on 9-11. And um, that was the day that they chose to uh, have the 9-11 event. And um, over here, I've just thrown this in because it might uh, I was thinking it might be in interest of, of certain people that it's popular today that, to say that Jesus is a form of Zeus, but it actually is a 
transliteration from the Hebrew Yeshua, and I go through the steps in showing how if you go from Hebrew to Greek, and you have to add the S because of the male gender, and then you go from, from that to the English, and you end up with Jesus. So it's, it's not a form of Zeus at all. So the very first fundamental foundational principle of the occult is what you are looking at right here. And if this is so important, I'm going to stress it. In fact, in the English language, we have three words, esoteric, arcane, and occult. And when I got to studying these words, I discovered they all mean the same thing. They mean hidden knowledge. Remember the hidden knowledge I talked to you about in the previous talk that gives you a power base? And it says in the Word of God that, in, that's, that Satan appears as an angel of light. But if you read the Greek there, it says he masquerades as an angel of light. Well, what does that word masquerade in the Greek mean? It literally means, like you see in the picture there, Satan wears a mask as an angel of light. And right there in that verse, you have the key to how the occult works. There is everything in the occult world works behind a false front. So once you understand that, then it's no surprise that a lot of uh, the reality is an illusion that we're being given. It's no surprise that the Illuminati would want to give us a false front because that is the very uh, method that the occult world works by. If they didn't, they wouldn't be themselves. So here I have given you some, and, and there are many examples, but I'm just giving you a few examples of the esoteric versus the exoteric. Esoteric means the hidden. Exoteric means externalized, what the world can see. So in Nazi Germany, the Hitler's bodyguard was called the Schutzstaffel, SS. But the esoteric name for Schutzstaffel was Schwarze Sonne. What does that mean? It means the black sun. That's the logo there. And if you go to their holy places, you'll see that black sun. And you will see that black sun emblem now in, um, like there's Ukrainian groups that are neo-Nazi and so forth. You're, you're, you will see this now, now that you're aware that that's, that's the black sun, you're going to start seeing it around. The word, or I, I should say the, the three letters, OTO, and the OTO, by the way, have their own type of trauma-based mind control and their own codes. That's, besides the four uh, Christian groups I told you, the OTO also has their own uh, programming codes. And they are the distillation of a lot of occult science of a lot of groups. So you, there's, you may have a number of uh, lodge systems whose members may be, go back to the OTO. The OTO is very close, if not synonymous with the Illuminati. And their exoteric name for OTO means Order of Oriental Templars, as you see up there. And then the order of the Torah is the esoteric. Now, I was the one that got the privilege of exposing that the Watchtower Society is, is an exoteric name. Now, we would think that the Watchtower was being 
that the name was picked by Charles Chase Russell because he considered himself watching out for the people. But as I got into understanding better what was going on, I started seeing hidden in his writings Enochian magic, and I came to the conclusion that the that within the Watchtower Society, that they must be practicing the Luciferian group, the covens, satanic covens within the uh, Watchtower Society, must be practicing Enochian magic. And I had the privilege of, of I've talked with or interviewed a number of uh, people that were within the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, people especially at their headquarters, Bethel headquarters, and they indeed went, they indeed held satanic rituals, and they indeed practiced Enochian magic. So it was, it was interesting that my analysis came out uh, accurate on that. But the original Watchtower magazine had the Masonic Knights Templar logo on it. And it's because Charles Tate Russell, who founded the Watchtower Society, was a member of the Russell Illuminati family, as well as a Freemason. His father-in-law was a Freemason. His wife was a socialist. And um, little known, a lot of people don't realize, because it's kept hidden, his wife actually did a lot of the writing for him. And she, if you look at, at, at the roots of socialism and communism, you'll see it goes back to these occult secret societies. So it all ties in. There's a lot involved. A lot of tie-ins between these different groups. So here we see Aleister Crowley's book, 777, again. And then this is another book on Gematria. And we, you actually bump into this now. On the, the monster uh, drink cans, the energy drink cans, if you look at that, you'll see that that is the Hebrew number six. It's 666. And it says, it says on, it, 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 on the drink, on the can, it says, unleash the beast. Wait, wait, you, you know, you can't make this stuff up. It, if, it wasn't, it, if it wasn't that they repeatedly showed you that, that you know, there, someone who's in, in the occult and understands this stuff, he knows what they're doing. You know, 666, unleash the beast. And so, um, because of numerology, the Jews consider the number 18 as lucky because if you take chai, which is the word in Hebrew to life or alive, it reduces down in numerology, in Hebrew numerology to 18. Again, this is repeating what I was talking about, how Gematria numerology came from Babylon, Greece, and the Jews. And um, the ancient, ancients said that the numbers were given, uh, uh, given this, this, this kind of occult science was given to them by, by the fallen angels. And um, then there's number systems, there's angel numbers that are given by spirit guides. Um, so an example of an angel number, seven five, or excuse me, one five seven means victory. Now, an early example of gematria in history, remember I said that Babylon practiced this, Sargon II, and you find him referred to in the Word of God in Isaiah 20, verse 1. He built a massive wall around his capital that he built for himself. It was a new capital. 
it didn't last very long because it was called Fortress of Sargon. He, he ended up abandoning it uh, after you know, it wasn't the capital for that long. But he used the gematria to build it. This is very similar to the operative Masonic guilds that built the cathedrals that put in so many, so much numerology into the cathedrals. So he took his, his name, his title, and the numerical value of his name was 16,283. So he made the length of the wall around his capital exactly to match his name, the numerology of his name. And it had 157 towers. As you see here, I give you 157 means victory, and 12 is a sign of completeness. It's very interesting, you will notice that there were, it, not only in his capital were there 12 gates, but there's been 12 gates done on other cities too. In fact, when you go to Revelations 21:12, and you read about the heavenly city, J Jerusalem, that comes down, again, you have 12 gates. And so what does 12 mean? Well, 12 is a, is a symbol of completion. The, the intrinsic value that has been assigned or, or believed to emanate from 12 is the sense of, of completion. So you have 12 zodiac signs, 12 works of Hercules, and on and on. There are many other examples in the ancient world where you have 12, um, well, and we have the 12 tribes of Israel, don't we? Uh, and 12 disciples of Christ. In fact, I've had some Masons tell me that the New Testament was actually an esoteric book. That you, if you understand numerology, you understand the Bible in a different way than the Christians. Let's go back. So, the number 13 is a very, very powerful occult number. And uh, it, it symbolizes in the occult world rebellion. But it also is kind of a lucky number. Uh, so it, it's got a connotation of, of luck with rebellion. And it's very interesting because most people don't study history on the level that I do. Uh, but the British had a number of colonies in North America. And the um, during the American Revolution, the colonial government that formed the United States, the, their, their um, congresses, they had to work at creating 13 uh, states. You had the, the Bahamas, you had Bermuda. Bermuda begged the colonies to be allowed to be part of the United States, and they turned them down. Well, that would have made 14. That doesn't work. So they worked at having 13 states when they got created. Again, if you look at the second American Revolution, which was when the South rebelled against the North and formed the Confederate States of America, their first flag, they had seven stars. And the next, which is also a, a powerful number, but from there, they, the Confederacy did a 13-star flag right here. And again, they had to work at making sure that they had 13 states because it, it could have gone a different way. And in fact, when you look at most maps of the Civil War, you won't count in the maps 13 Confederate states because Missouri and Kentucky, which were border states, most maps show as border states and not as part of the Confederacy, but they, they were part of the Confederacy as far as the Confederacy was concerned. And it, it was important for them to have 13 
And, and so, also what's most amazing is the American stripes are 13 white and red stripes, right? Again, we have 13. And the, um, the first, like, recognized, I mean, the American Revolution had many flags, and a lot of the American Revolution flags were snakes on the flag. But uh, what's interesting about the flag that became known as the official flag was that, and look over here on the top left flag here, the, the one, that first one that's got the, the stars in the circle, the 13 stars in the circle, um, reminds you a, a little bit of the EU. But um, that flag there with the 13 stars, actually the, there was a period of time that the British East India Company flew that flag as theirs. So the question that I would ask people is, is it the United States, the colonies were revolting against the British East India Company, right? They, they supposedly threw their tea into the Boston Harbor, which that, that's, whole thing is kind of half myth, but anyway, um, if they were so much against the British, why did they take their trading company flag? Well, there's a big clue there as to how things are running. The corporations never quit running the America. It was really the corporations that created the colonies, and so when the Americans revolted against the king, they got a new political system. But as you know from life, a large share of the control in life is done by the corporations. And so the corporations continue to run things. Now you see why we, we adopted the British East India flag as ours. There's been so much in Hollywood using 13 and using 666. I mean, I have, um, somebody did this for me. They took little vignettes of Hollywood movies where there's 666 shown. Oh my. There are so many Hollywood movies where in the course of the movie, you know, the address would be 666. Or when the person goes to go up the elevator, he, he's shown pushing a six in here, he gets inside the elevator, they show him pushing a six in the elevator, and then when he gets up, they show the six again, six, six, six. There's so much of that. Plus, there's many different ways that 666 can be uh, created. Um, so it can be hidden in many, many different ways. Um, I might, since I think I have the time, I might digress and tell a little story here. I have so many stories I can tell. But, uh, I worked as a draftsman for Federal Highway Administration. And so their department, department that I worked for, uh, drawing roads, they decided that they wanted someone inside of our department, Federal Lands Highway Division, to come up with a logo, okay? Everything was supposed to be above board. We're going to create a logo, and, and people within our branch were to submit, uh, were to give submissions, and then we would vote on which design, which logo we liked. So I kind of outdid myself. I've always been kind of an overachiever. And I worked really hard in the evenings and I came up with quite a few, what I thought were interesting logos. So I wasn't just gonna, because there was no limit on how many you could submit. And so I waited and because I knew specifically when this contest was going to close. It was going to close at noon on a particular day. 
So just a few minutes before the contest closed, because I didn't want to give away any of my secrets on what I had done with the logo, I came down and I submitted my logos. And I asked the man, and this was the department that ran this contest was the computer department, which were all like the cultists down there. And I asked the man, has have you gotten a lot of other submissions? And he said, no, you are the only person to submit any logo for this contest. So I waited around until the submission time period was over. Nobody else submitted it. So what's that to a reasonable person suggest that uh, one of my logos is going to win since I'm the only one to submit something? Well, in the event, it happened quite differently than one might imagine. When it came time to vote on the logos, mine were not for the voting, and a logo that was 666 was, according to the people that counted the votes, that was the one that won, was a 666 logo. And I asked why my logos had not been in the contest, and they said, oh, we are so sorry. Uh, here, we are going to give you a shirt with your one logo on the front and one logo on the back as a consolation that you, we forgot to put your logos in the contest. You're probably all familiar with the this this sign. Down in the left hand, it simply means Hail Satan. It's also a sign used by Freemasonry called the Two Pillar Sign. And in the Illuminati, if you use it and you have someone and you do it quite quickly and they're not there, they're, and you hit their subconscious, you will actually trance the, the personality that's holding the body at the moment will be tranced out and a deeper altar will take its place. So it's, um, it's also used for mind control. And I could have put pictures up here besides Bush. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. I have pictures of the Clintons just gleefully, obviously using it as a sign of Satan. I have Obama using it gleefully in, in such a way I mean, you look at the expressions on their face and it's just like, it's kind of scary. Um, so there you see Anton LaVey up in the top right. He started the Church of Satan and he did trauma-based mind control on his children. And one of his sons contacted me and was very appreciative of the work I've done concerning the trauma-based mind control. So see, even out of the depths of Satan, you will have people that uh, choose the life. So this is just giving you a, a little bit of an idea how so many of these symbols are interchangeable. All of these symbols stand for Satan, but see there's interchangeable symbols. Light equals wisdom. Wisdom equals the snake. The snake equals light. Lucifer equals the light bearer of light. So you can use these. These symbols are, are quite interchangeable. And this is what and, and this is what the occult world does. So they get their little inside jokes. Is they have so much of these. This can be substituted for that. That can be substituted for that. And so it also works on with the number system. And so all of these uh, logos stand for Satan. Saturn stands for Satan. Venus stands for Lucifer. And, um, and here you see the sun, that sun symbol there that that uh, Catholic is carrying. And that's very common uh, pic picture of them. Um, stands for Lucifer. I want you to notice something here. 
Because on a regular American flag, the way it's the official way that the stars are to be pointed, the stars on an official American flag, the official way, is for the, the point to be pointed up. But when they're pointed down like that, that's a sign of safety. That is a satanic American flag. There's no doubt about it. This is a Hillary rally. Uh, Hillary Clinton's rallies have been like this. Maybe half of the people, were, if not most of them, are paid to go to it. Nobody's really enthusiastic about her. And um, I was just amazed that sometimes they're really blatant with the fact that she's an Illuminati witch. And um, Bill has even publicly said, yes, yeah, she goes to covens in California. Sometimes these people, the, their audacity amazes me because I guess they just figure they can get by with anything they want. Now we're looking at some Illuminati symbols. One of the women that I was helping get out of Illuminati, she called me up and she goes, Hey, my dad, my dad's coming. She was, she was, her family line was the Rothschild bloodline. And she said, my dad, who's an Ipsissimus in the Illuminati, he's going to come to my house. Would you like to come over and meet him? <laughs> I don't know what you would have done. Um, I decided, well, I have God on my side. Let's give this a try. Uh, it was creepy. But when I, when I met the man, he had a ring exactly like that. It was a, it was, no, excuse me, he had a silver ring um, like that with the snake swallowing its head on his ring. And then later when he got from, uh, I'm saying things wrong. He was a grand master at the time with a silver ring, and then later he was promoted to Ipsissimus and had the gold ring like that. Sorry, I got confused on myself. So here we see the Illuminati pyramid being made with the hand with the all-seeing eye. That is so popular today with Hollywood. And um, we see the Theosophical Society having the Ouroboros, which is the snake swallowing its tail, the Illuminati symbol there, with all these other occult symbols. In fact, uh, you know, they started out their, their original magazine was Lucifer, but then they changed it to Lucis. Um, here we see a drawing of a high level uh, ritual, and you'll see the caduceus there. The caduceus is a symbol of two snakes that goes back to Babylon that's been adopted by the medical profession. And then up there, you see the immator, Im, the eight symbol, the, the immortality symbol of the Illuminati, and that has been a goal of the Illumina, Illuminati. That's one of their big secrets is their program for immortality. And I gave a prophecy, excuse me, not prophecy, but I gave a free your mind speech on immortality. So if you type in Fritz Springmeier, uh, free your mind, and um, perhaps immortality, you can hope. Oh, to watch my whole talk on that whole subject about the Illuminati and immortality. The Catholic churches all over the world, they have all kinds of Illuminati symbols on them. Uh, uh, you know, and, um, well, what more needs to be said? Oh, in this, so the mostly Protestants, but the Christian church in general, the apostate Christian church, all, all the mainstream churches basically, they wanted to have a gathering of all these people. And so look at, at their advertisement for gathering. They have a pyramid with an all-seeing eye on it. Boy, 
as if people today can't catch on. I don't know. They, they, they seem to uh, they seem to think all of us are stupid, or they just don't care. The instructions from the Illuminati that go out to all the different, like the uh, uh, rabbi of the main rabbi there in Jerusalem, uh, the Grand Mufti in Cairo, the Protestant leaders, um, all these leaders, uh, even some uh, Muslim leaders, their instructions go out from the United Grand Lodge there in London. These are some pictures of it. And from the very beginning, you'll see in the center, you see the archons there? You see the fallen angels with the cloven hooves? And from the very beginning, they had these on their logos. And people tell me, no, 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 Freemasonry started out a Christian organization. Oh well, yeah, why, are, why do they have all of these satanic symbols and all of these demons and devils and fallen angels and their logos and stuff. Explain that to me. How's, how's that related to Christ? This is Brigham Young, who was the leader of the Mormons. And um, with his, you can see his, on his shirt, his Masonic pen. And these are a few Masonic police badges because many police organizations, they, they have Masonic organizations that are police. And, and these are some of the American presidents in the Masonic garb that have been Freemasons. And what Freemasonry did, and I, I managed, you know, I, I spent like a thousand dollars on rare Masonic books. And I also was very fortunate that somebody told me, they said, Fritz, the Central Masonic Library, which is in Iowa, will let you borrow books from them. I said, you mean if I'm not a Freemason? And they said, yeah, they're not going to ask whether you're a Freemason or not. As long as you treat the books well and you pay for them to come and, and go. So I was able to borrow books from the Central Masonic Library. Can you believe that from my research? Incredible. But anyway, I bought a Masonic book that explained all of their hand signs and so forth like this. And so what I tell you is, is the, the gist of it. Freemasonry studied natural art and hand gestures from around the world and then incorporated them into a set of secret signs. And then they, they use numbers also in secret number rituals, as you can see over there, the key to their rituals. Uh, let's go back. So, as you know, uh, the federal government uh, felt more comfortable um, putting me away, and my attorney that was to protect me basically told me that I was being put away for the work I do. Um, that the, uh, someone who had retired from the feds told him that the federal government had been trying to put me in prison for many years. They had just not figured out how to do it. But they finally managed to. So I was in prison with people that had these kind of tattoos. I saw a lot of number tattoos. Eight, eight stands for Heil Hitler, and um, 311 for the KKK, and if you see a 14, that's the battle cry of whites. When I say battle cry, it's the cry of whites, I mean white supremacists that want to protect the white race from other races. And then you will, I saw plenty of uh, Satanists with 666 tattooed on foreheads, on their necks, and so forth. And there you see Odin's warriors. And then I show you the triad and the Yakuza, which are, are both secret societies as well as criminal mafia organizations. The, there are many different triad organizations, and they do occult rituals. Um, they have very elaborate tattoos. 
So, the question again, how many occult symbols do you see? Quite often you see the sun. I might interrupt here something that's kind of, again, something that's a little chilly. In 1990, when I started exposing the Illuminati, it was very common for companies to have a logo with the capstone not on the pyramid. Now, of course, you might ask, what does a pyramid have to do with America or American companies or anything like that? Well, it really doesn't. It's because it's an occult symbol. But then you could take it one step further. Why would someone make a pyramid with the capstone floating above? Well, the occult significance of that was when the Antichrist had not taken his throne, the pyramid, or the capstone on the pyramid was not on the pyramid. Uh, that's what their secret literature said. When I came out of prison, the logos were then putting the capstone on the pyramid. So, if I'm reading that correctly, their Antichrist is here, and, um, you know, I think I've talked a little bit about that with some of you. When I did research in the early 90s, I, I was interviewing people that had been abducted by aliens, people that had been in the underground installations and so forth, and the badges that they saw on the alien races, you look at these and they're occult symbology. All occult symbology. The Draconis symbol is the symbol that Charles Stage Russell used on his books. This, uh, there's a Bank of America with this, and you see this everywhere. Now that you're more familiar that the occult use of symbols, and you, you, go, you go into this bank, and I just did this because it's just one sample of thousands of things that you'll see out there. Um, they, they have a woman that looks sort of like Hillary Clinton with uh, puppet strings, and she's inside a, of this invisible cube, and then a pyramid in the back, and the checkerboard square, which uh, relates to Freemasonry and the occult. And so that's um, oh, on, on the left hand side is their Illuminati way of saying as above, so below. And um, the Miss Liberty is really a star or Isis. Um, uh, so we have so much occult symbology around us. That's all. Thank you. We'll take it. Away.